Hello there, everyone. It's Christy, and welcome to another episode of Feminist Talk Back, a series that had to be put on hold while I was in the UK doing data collection during the 19, I'm sorry, 19, the 2017 snap election. But I am back, and I'm back with my guest here. We're going to be talking today about his research into political representation in Canada, in particular. Now, this is an interesting topic for me because obviously I'm I'm interested in the nexus between gender and politics, but because I deal with voting behavior. Um, I don't really talk too much about what happens when men and women get elected into office or the background for that. And so Tim is, because he's done some original research on that, is very kindly agreed to come on to the show and explain his background with this, how he found the topic, found it interesting, and what his results were. Now this is from an earlier research, there's been a couple elections, but I think for the historical purposes, it will be a very interesting show. And so Tim, thanks so much for being on. Sure, my pleasure, Christy. Yeah. So I'm going to I'm gonna do a lot of, I did a lot of the talking now, but it's going to be your turn to do most of the talking for the rest of the show, because we want to hear about what you learned in the course of your research. But before we start, why don't you just uh, tell a little bit of, don't dox yourself or anything you, know, like anything you don't want to share, but a little bit of a background in terms of how you ended up on the program you did and why you found this topic interesting. Sure. Um, I do a lot of watching and of videos in the feminist do community and the, I guess if you, if you want to call it the SAW, anti SAW uh, community as well. Um, I watch uh, Kevin Logan, Dick Coughlin, uh, Garnet, yourself, Christy, a lot, um, and several others as well. And I I've always been interested in feminism since I was probably in my teenage years. Uh, I had heard about it in school, in a politics class, and I learned more about it as I went through university. And then when I got to grad school, I had decided to do a project uh, involving feminism. I didn't know it was going to be about female candidates and political parties at that time. It just sort of evolved into that. Um, so I guess I can start with the story of um, how I came to study this topic. Um, around about 2007, I had been taking a course at the University of Western Ontario in uh, a city called London in Canada, with also with a, a river running through it called, called the Thames. So it's kind of an exact copy of the city in England. Uh, that shows you the unoriginality of a lot of the names in North America, but that's a different topic, I guess. But I was taking a class in the Women in Politics, and I had a professor who was very uh, feminist, and she uh, really influenced me on my outlook on things. Before that, I had not really considered myself a feminist, but then after that, I did. And she had um, a lot of uh, experience. She's an academic that studies feminism. She gave me, uh, uh, she gave myself in, in the class a lot of background about the different. Um, subsets of feminism, like radical feminism, environmental, um, conservative, uh, intersectional, you know, there's lots on those, I'm sure everybody knows. And she had two books in that class um, that I uh, basically formed a lot of my thesis around by uh, Linda Trimble and uh, Jane Ascott uh, was one. And then, sorry, Christy, I just need to go to my bibliography for a second, pardon me. Yeah, no worries at all. Wow, well, I'm really impressed that you're pulling up your bibliography for a spontaneous chat. I just go, ah, oh, the name is something like this, and I'll figure it out later. <laughs> so. Yeah, I, uh, sorry, I just don't want to, I, I want to give credit to those women because I really use their work a lot. That's, and, that's great, of course. And if you have any links that you want to give me afterwards, I can put them in the description box or people can just use the Google machine. Sure. Okay, so, um, you find it? yeah, it was, uh, yeah, sorry, Alinda uh, Trimble and Jane uh, Arscott, I believe is how you say it. It's called Still Counting Women of Politics Across Canada, and it was published in 2003, and that book is mostly a study of um, just women in politics in general, and a lot of uh, different um, aspects, not just uh, candidates and political parties. They kind of go through the history of uh, the women's movement in Canada, which uh, um, 
I had mentioned in, in the introduction that um, to the thesis is, a, is somewhat different from other ones in other countries. Uh, it wasn't quite as militant. They uh, didn't result. Uh, they more like petitions and things like that. Non nonviolent resistance, I guess Mandela before Mandela or before Gandhi kind of thing, and they um, they achieve. Uh, women can achieve the uh, voting rights uh, both at the same time as I think American and British women around like 1918, 1920. Um, there was some lag in some normal parts. Um, in Quebec, I guess people think Quebec is very progressive nowadays. Uh, that's the image people get of, of that part of Canada because it's French or just because uh, of their cosmopolitan uh, look on things. but. Before the '60s, Quebec was a was very um, conservative place because uh, the Catholic Church um, had a lot of influence over the province's um, governance, and women didn't get the vote until 1940 as a consequence. So you can see that there was a, a lag there in Quebec, uh, somewhat. And then also in my home province of uh, New Brunswick, there was uh, women got the vote in like 1921, but they couldn't run for office until 1934. So those were like the, the notable uh, lags. Um, so once I finished with that course in uh, May of uh, 2007, I uh, was applying to grad schools because I had finished my, uh, I had already finished my bachelor's before that because uh, I went to the University of Brunswick and then I had gone to London the uh, University of Western Ontario to do a few courses just to figure out what I, what I wanted to do for uh, graduate school. And then I ended up in Bergen. Um, it's kind of a funny story because um, I had, I actually know more about like international uh, relations and geopolitics and that kind of stuff. But this kind of came up and I thought it would be interesting because um, I had a prior uh, uh, thing with uh, the University of Bergen, I had gone there in 2004 as a uh, study exchange because the University of Brunswick and Bergen have a exchange agreement. So I had spent six months there. So when I, I know I noticed they had a, a good program with public policy, I went there. Um, and also it was the, the best place I had got into. So that was might have influenced uh, my decision as well. So yeah, you only I get up, one. Master, you only get one degree, you know. So at a, so from when some people go on. Right. Yeah. Know, and and um, but you want the best school you can get into. Basically. Yeah. So I went there in uh, August of 2007, and then uh, so the first year uh, of the program is courses, and because it was a two two year master program, uh, which is kind of against the norm in, in Norway at least, because they usually have um, they have five year ones. Where people will just they only do a master's. They don't do a bachelor's first, they just do a straight five year five year master. And that was a lot of people that I met when I was there and doing that. And they kind of thought it was it, it kinda of, it was kind of weird because it's it's it stuck out among their other uh, doctor uh, so their other master programs. And so uh, they found us they, they they taught us the first year was research methodology and uh, field work and stuff like that. Um, and we we're generating the topics in the second, uh, the first part of 2008. And then um, after May of 2008, we were supposed to go on our own and choose a supervisor and then go do our field work or, or to start writing or whatever, whatever methodology we had chosen, quantitative or qualitative, just go off and be independent somewhat besides, uh, you know, checking with supervisor here and there. Um, so I. At first, I had was going to do uh, like interviews and surveys as my way to collect just, data. Sorry, just to stop you there. So, uh, just for people who you know uh, talk about the social sciences being soft and not rigorous, um, a little bit. You know, you were taught the sci like scientific thinking and the idea of empiricism, the importance of data, the importance of observation, the role of theory in explaining, you know, creating um, a causal link between observation and forces mm -hmm. at work. You were taught about the difference between qualitative data and the kind of inferences you can draw from that versus survey data, which is drawn to be 
representative of a population, so you can generalize. So you are taught um, the methods of thinking in a rigorous scientific way that includes, you know, for this quant side, falsification from hypotheses and from the qual sides, an inductive way of, of creating theories to account for things that we don't have theories for or to expand theories or um, investigate theories. I'm kind of giving you, it's a very softball answer, I'm very much begging the question, but <laughs> I just want to kind of get out there that when well, students go through a social science degree, it's not all about interpretivism and just forming an opinion and saying things. It's, there's a rigor there that we have to adhere to in order to go through and um, make it past the peer review process to get published in social science journals. Right. Um, yes. It was, it was a pretty rigorous uh, education they gave us. Um, they used a book by um, Gary King and uh, Robert O. Sorry, Robert O. King. Keohan and Sydney uh, Averba, which is called the Design and Social Inquiry, Scientific Inference and Qualitative Research. Um, and that was uh, trying to get uh, more rigorous qualitative research into the social sciences. And we talked about um, a lot of mid-range theory and grounded theory and adaptive theory, which is a newer one, which I sort of use in, in my thesis. Which was developed by uh, someone named a uh, professor named Derek later, and he wanted to bridge adaptive and mid range together in a more, uh, I guess, more workable framework within social sciences because um, he felt that the, the two of them were at odds because uh, one, I grounded sort of with um, saying that you should generate theory um, beforehand, before you go research, and then mid-range was, I believe, the opposite, where you cut your evidence and then theorize afterwards. I could have that backwards, but that's just what I remember. I do go into that in my thesis a little bit about the two different, the three of them, and how they influenced me. Um, and that was a big part of uh, our uh, development. My supervisor, um, he was kind of of the opinion that theory um, wasn't the most important part of uh, academic research. So once I got to him, he had me focus more on the data collection and stuff like that. That was just his philosophy. Um, you, you need to have it in there, of course, uh, to, to satisfy um, the need to to connect your research to uh, and your findings to some kind of uh, grounding and uh, just logical thinking. That's the way that he put it to me. And so I just kind of went it from that. And his, his name was Odin. Uh, just that's very Norwegian, I, I would thought always, but um, <laughs> that's true. It's, it's spelled differently than the, the traditional way, though. Um, so, uh, he actually helped me develop the topic uh, more than anybody else. Um, I had, as I stated, in the, perhaps you read that I was kind of had this big idea of doing um, sort of like a meta, why is it hard for women to get into politics uh, kind of study. And um, that's just too big. That's, you know, like probably 20 master theses uh, slash doctoral dissertations uh, to explain that, um, why it's hard for women to get into politics. So he had the idea, um, we were just talking, he, he said, oh, you seem to like talking about political parties. I'm like, yeah, I find them really interesting. So we have them, why don't we develop something along the lines of, of a political party and how women, you know, interact with the, the structures of that and how they, you know, and then we, we kind of settled on candidacy and um, women winning elections and stuff like that. And then, um, yeah, Henry, so just, sorry, if I could just jump in again, um, right, because I'm coming at it from having gone through this process and actually supervised some masters. Um, well, in the, in the UK, they're called dissertations. But, you know, the point for people who haven't done a master's degree in social science, the, the purpose of, of um, sorry, writing a dissertation or a thesis 
degrees. What happens is, you know, during the or taught the methods and the theories and you take some specialization courses to become more familiar with the body of literature that uh, in that topic area that you're getting your degree in. And then the point of the thesis or the dissertation is uh, it's kind of like an apprenticeship. You are then task of setting yourself a question because that's what researchers do all the time. They have to determine what they're going to investigate academically. And then it's the first chance that you have to do, you know, collect your own data, do your own analysis, and then come draw conclusions from your own analysis. The role of a supervisor is, um, you know, we have a sense after having gone through it and published articles of given the word count you have and the skill set you have, what can a student reasonably put to themselves as a research question and succeed at answering such that they demonstrate all of the competencies that they were taught during over the course of their education. Right, so if you've gone through the degree scheme and you've absorbed it correctly, you should be able to do an independent piece of research that in theory could be submitted for peer review to be published because that's kind of your apprenticeship, you know, your job training. And so, yeah, the role of the supervisor isn't to give you tasks to do things or to hand you things and tell you what to do. They're there to help you understand the process of narrowing a question or looking for data or going through the whole process of what original researchers do every single day. So I just again, wanted, since we were on the topic, I just wanted to jump in with that observation because for people who haven't gone through the process, they don't really know what a master's degree entails. I thought it was a great opportunity to explain that. So anyway, yes, getting on to you actually doing your research. Yeah, and I, I guess I can just add that that was my experience, what you just described. The first, that was the face of the first year was uh, the training and we did like a reading list. They got us to, you know, gather some articles. We weren't uh, required to use all of them later on, but um, I did use most of the ones that I had uh, put on that list. And then we had to, you know, write a, a methodology paper and then also a, uh, research field they called it and uh, that had the path where you can go on to the thesis and then once you get to the thesis you're pretty much um, on your own except for the um the guiding apprenticeship of um your supervisor um i had two of them uh mostly because uh, the first uh one odin he uh he retired about half well i say three quarters of the way through of uh when i was um doing it my thesis and then um so i just uh went to um Another woman named uh, Linda, who uh, was really helpful as well, just to help me finish it off. And um, I give both of them a lot of credit, you know, for helping me uh, get it, uh, you know, finished. Because a lot of um, a lot of when people start a, a thesis or doctoral, a high percentage, uh, sorry, a uh, pardon me, a high, a high percentage of them don't ever finish it, and. I think they they told us at the beginning the the professors who were overseeing the the first year, um, that you know a lot of the people in this room probably won't finish their theses and he said you know um, it's our aim to try to get as many of you to finish it as possible, and he said I'm more concerned about uh, you know getting it finished than making it like a perfect you know groundbreaking uh, paper or piece of uh, research that we put it. And um, so th th that was in my mind a lot of the time. So um, our group was like um, 25 people, I think. And if I remember correctly, I think maybe 10 finished uh, at some point. Um, me, for example, I, I, was, I, I ran over a year and a half over what it should have been because um, it's supposed to be a two-year program, at least minimum, and then as you know, you, you can get extensions sometimes uh, if your supervisor is satisfied with the reason. Uh, I don't know if that's ever happened to you personally, if you had to go over the uh, prescribed time to finish it. But um, a lot of the people that my group had uh, to uh, an extension. So uh, I guess just getting back to um, how I generated the topic. Um, so um, working with Odin, he had introduced me to a Professor's work in uh, from te from Texas, a man named Richard Matlin, and he has done a lot of work um, on 
American, Norwegian, and Canadian politics uh, from the perspective of, of uh, women in uh, politics. Uh, the candidates' disease in uh, in different ways, uh, how incumbency affects it. Uh, he worked with one uh, another uh, researcher by the name of uh, Stuttered, uh Donnelly Stuttered, and they had focused a lot on the sacrificial lamb, um, that concept of women political parties put them out there as um, just cannon fodder and, and unwinnable districts, just for a show of um, a force, if you want to put it like that. Yeah, it's when parties it's when parties want to up the number of women that they field overall in terms of candidates so they can say look half of the women that we ran in the last election were women but where they put the women to run like if you can parachute people in as they can in the uk into a, a district or if they recruit people um they're recruited in dis the women are disproportionately found in districts that are unwinnable right so you get the positive accreditation for trying to get women involved in politics and go oh but they can't win um or you put them in situations <clears throat> where they can't win yeah so that's called that's the sacrificial lamb right. um, theory um and that's been um at least in their minds uh they studied it uh particularly uh, looking at the canadian federal election in 1984 which is actually my starting point which I'll, I'll get back to that later i suppose um they looked at the 84 election because it was the first time that women had uh, been, uh, I believe elected 10% of the, the total amount of candidates uh, to the Parliament of Canada, and they they tested the, the sacrificial land theory because the Progressive Conservative Party of Canada, which won that election, which is now the Conservative Party of Canada, um, they had a, this is Brian Maroney, if anybody knows who that is. Uh, he, uh, this is when he won, became Prime Minister the for the first time, and they had run a lot of women in um, Quebec, uh, as uh, people and people were saying, "Oh, it's just sacrificial lambs." And the theory, a common notion was uh, in that election is um, they had elected, um, I believe it was twenty three female MPs in that election, and most of them were from Quebec, and they because they thought it was a, just a fluke that they were meant just to be sacrificial lambs. But when the PCs won the election, um, they got elected just as a uh, matter of course because of Quebec shifted really um, forcefully to the Conservatives in that election. But uh, what Stoddard and uh, Matlin did is they looked, um, they simulated the election the results of 1980 uh, where, the, where the Liberals had won and compared it, uh, used those numbers with the results of. Uh, in, in 84 and it turned out that the same number of females would have been elected anyway and then they also um they, they simulated it uh of other ways as well and it came out that um the results would have been the same anyway so it was not the fact that that it was just a, a stroke of luck that they had won so in their minds, the sacrificial lamb theory, at least in that case, wasn't um, a. Uh, you couldn't say that, that they had just put them out there to be uh, sacrificial lambs. Sorry. Right, um, so, if I can just again expand on how we do this as social scientists. So, that doesn't mean that sacrificial lamb theory is wrong. It's saying when you um, hypothesize that this could account for. Um, like if you ran this in a different scenario, that you would get a different outcome if social lamb theory was at work, right? And that's what they tested with the data. They said, okay, let's go back to when the liberals would have done better. I think that was, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, yeah. And would the result had been different um, because of this controlling for the effect of this swing that happened in the 84 election. And because the results would have been the same, there's no difference to need that needs explanation so because there's no difference between those two outcomes that requires explanation sacrificial lamb theory doesn't tell us anything more about why women were elected in these case in this case a little bit different from you know um basically you know if you look at it from a hard science point of view you would probably throw more of the theory away but because social phenomenon can be driven by various theories 
you know, we can test a theory and the theory can not provide explanation for an observation, or in this case, there's nothing to observe that needs to be explained. But that doesn't necessarily say the theory doesn't explain something in a different situation. To kind of expand out the use of theories. Yeah, um, sorry. I guess I didn't explain that as well as I would have liked, but I'm just going back to where I had uh, written about that article. And, but yes, they had come to the conclusion that sacrificial lamb, at least in that one, just that one case, and that, that's the key point is that that, that one case is the 84 election. It, um, the, the Conservative Party had also stated uh, ahead of time that they had um, expected to win 25 to 30 seats in Quebec anyway. So if they had expected to lose in Quebec, then you could say that, okay, then they would probably put their beats second to sacrificial lambs. And, um, but based on the fact that they, they were very confident that uh, uh, they were going to win in Quebec because at that time there was probably in Quebec. Quebec was about 80 seats now, I think. Um, but back then in the 80s, it was probably like 65. So they, they want to win. They're thinking that they want about half the seats in Quebec. So that's one of the reasons why they point to that the uh, conservatives weren't just putting them out there as well. Um, even though there's a notion in, um, in political science that um, that right wing parties. Um, don't try as hard as left-wing parties do to get women into office or just advance women in general because of ideology and that's sort of what i that influenced me as well like i that's a big part of what i did my work was looking at ideology inside of political parties and um metlin and stutter uh their work was really big uh for me as well um see metlin i think the reason why uh my supervisor bought metlin was because um he had worked at the university of bergen for some time like he was a professor there and he had done work on uh, Norway when he was there as well. And um, he also studied um, how political um, systems affect the possibility of women getting elected. So he looked at Norway and Canada and um, how like multi-member districts, uh, they produce more women, in his opinion, in his research, um, because Norway's had a proportional representation system for uh, quite some time. Actually, I think they've always had it since they were independent from, um, from Denmark in 1905. Uh, and they have um, a really high percentage of female candidates, and they have a whole list of uh, female prime ministers, um, including the one who's in power right now. Um, so I, I kind of draw, I drew from three or four of his articles with, with uh, Stuttler, and um, that sort of formed the um, the core of the thesis. I kind of give the, the two of them the structural credit for um, how I designed it to, um, you know, to, to present the data and the variables and stuff like that. But this, if you want to call it like the abstract um, inspiration, comes more from the four uh, authors from that course I took in uh, two thousand seven. They um, just their, you know, commitment to feminism and telling the history of it, and I sort of wanted to tell the history of you know, Canadian, you know, feminism, uh, the struggle for uh, you know women's rights and stuff like that in Canada, as as uh, as at the same time also looking at um, you know the the different uh, variables that affect women getting elected and um, getting to be candidates, because that's what I found. Um, I couldn't find any research on um, anything past like 1994, as far as um, the amount of um, women getting elected, because Matlin and Stutter did, they covered 25 years, like 1970, um, I believe it was seven to 1994, and that provincial level and they looked at the different provinces in Canada because um, like like the different states in America it's, it's quite different when you go from you know different uh, di jurisdiction to different jurisdiction because Quebec is uh, the most pronounced one um, because they've gone from as I said before they were really right-wing Catholic society pre-1960s now they're this really social democratic progressive part of Canada now um, right. So 
Before I, I'm just going to interrupt. Um, you you might be at a table where you're tapping it because every t every so often I hear like a clunk. Um, you sort of oh, that might be people. my um, I have restless leg syndromes. So <laughs> what that is? Right. Sorry, I'll stop doing yeah, that. Yeah, so I don't um, know. It's okay. Well, you can just keep doing it. Just don't bump the table because okay. there's just this thunking going on in the background. And I'll cut all this out of the actual hangout. But um, yeah, so if you want, yeah, just wanted to let you know for audio quality um, when, you, sure, okay. when you listen to yourself on the playback. All right, so yeah, getting back to um, their Catholic being conservative thing. Pick it up again. Yeah, so Quebec made a, a serious shift. Um, it's known as the um, Quiet Revolution. And it mainly because it you didn't hear much about it outside of Quebec itself. And it was just a slow trans transformation over maybe 15 or so years. I'm an expert on that. I, I just learned about it in school and how it, they eventually, uh, the Catholic church was, you know, slowly fr froze out of Quebec political decisions altogether almost. And uh, now we have Quebec as this really progressive, um, you know, social uh, change engine in Canada because they do a lot of um, like we, we have a, a national assisted dying law now since last summer and they have had theirs for several years beforehand and um, that's that's an example of like what I mean how they've changed so much in, in the 45 50 years since since the 60s but uh, so they also they look they look at the different provinces and they found that my area eastern Canada also known as Atlanta Canada Kind of legs behind the rest of Canada uh, when it came to getting more women into the provincial um, leg legislatures. So I kind of found that interesting. Um, yeah. So let's go through a little bit about um, the your you know the research itself, and if you could explain a bit on what are the theories about why women run and why women you know don't run and whether and investigations into uh, what, at least, you know, for the Canadian data, uh, what happens when women do one run, can they win? So starting out, maybe just start, yeah, we can start from the beginning with uh, theories about women's uh, participation um, in running for office. What page is that, Sue? Oh, I'm sorry, I just want to know, if, I wasn't looking at any particular page, I just want to know, like, we talked about sacrificial lamb. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, okay. Um, yeah, just more so generally. Yeah, just like some of the theories yeah, that just, you oh, sure, okay. introduced um, to. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, just uh, it, just one, it. Um, <laughs> so earlier I talked about this. There's this general notion that uh, you know left wing, you know parties, are more um, receptive to women, just in general when it comes to any kind of political party uh, function, like um, going from you know the administrative roles to the candidates to ministers and, and, and such. So. There's a theory called um, the contagion of the left, or and it's just called contagion theory. A lot of the times, it, it's in different contexts. But um, I just want to get to where I have that written down here. So, eventually, what it was developed was back in the 1950s. Um, some researchers thought that um, right wing parties had influenced left wing parties because right-wing parties that started using polling data and surveys and stuff like that before left-wing parties did then left-wing parties and then effort to com compete with them had started doing that um, kind of uh, research as well into, um, you know, finding out what voters want. Um, because polling, it started in the U.S. in like the 1930s with Pew. Like they are the originators of the poll and they're still around to this day. Um, so that was the first what, first time it was introduced. Then it came along in the 60s that um, the, the, the left-wing version of contagion theory, which was that Remy parties were going to adopt, uh, had adopted the catch-all um, kind of politics where you appeal to like literally everybody, not just um, the middle class and above, to uh, you know, compete with these socialist parties. Um, you know, uh, and also they developed mass membership structures. The, the left wing, the socialist parties did, kind of like the whole union, workers of the world unite kind of uh, view of political parties. Um, but then it was developed into a, uh, a feminist version, where um, they looked, they applied it to, okay, which spectrum is more uh, of the political spectrum is more. Uh, pardon me, I'm repeating myself. Uh, 
which of which political parties were the ones that were helping women the most and they looked in oh it's left-wing socialist parties uh from the far left that were influencing the more centrist right-wing parties uh so it would start in any given country where these smaller parties uh would nominate women and then it would kind of you know spread to the rest of them and then overall the amount of women would increase and um when we look at canada because uh, that's i guess that's what I'm, I'm next one on is uh there's the ndp which is formerly known as the cooperative uh, sorry the the cooperative so the ccf i don't know the acronym at this moment in time but um they had started as a, a workers party in the 1930s and then grew um into the the third party in our, in our system to this day and they have always been more progressive and consequently they, they always have more women uh and what metlin started found is that um the NDP, uh as they increase their number of, of women uh in different contexts the rest of the other two the, the liberals and the conservatives did as well so that's why i i pulled that out and used it in my theoretical framework because of that cable well, that's let's see if, if, if that continued on you know as um as time went on because they kind of stopped in like the mid 90s and getting even further um and i just wanted to see if, if like the number of women working if, if it was continuing to rise and i drew a lot of questions out of um out of their research um yeah, you know i'm sorry if i could just jump in again here so methodologically what you're doing is you're taking a previous study and you're mm -hmm. replicating it in that you're extending it with new time periods so this is another, I'm just kind of explaining that this is a scientific method. This is, you know, you're taking certain findings and the conclusions drawn on earlier data, you're adding new data and looking at the trends to see if the explanations still hold or something has changed over time. So again, this is a very scientific process that you're engaging. Yeah, it's just an empirical way of seeing if the uh, Zerubbabel trend uh, phenomenon had continued on past what, you know, what I, I could find at the time. Um, now that was back in two thousand and eight and seven. So perhaps someone's done it subsequently. I, I don't know uh, at this moment in time. But um, so I wanted to look, look at the federal level because I felt like they um, they had looked at the federal level somewhat like uh, the, the eighty four election, mostly just that one, and then they were they were focused more on the federal level. And then when that was pointed out to me by a supervisor that that's what he had done on states and provinces, I thought, okay, well then I'll. Um, I'll try to do it in a different way, in a different time period, to see if, um, you know, if I can produce somewhat of the same results. And that towards the end of it, I kind of compare what I found and what they found, just to see that the connection. Um, then another uh, theory I used was called the model of the recruitment process, which is um, dealt by uh, Pippa Norris and uh, Joni Levendusky. Levendusky, yeah. Yeah, yes. I actually sponsored my British Academy postdoctoral fellowship. So. Okay, so you know her, okay. Yeah, well, okay. I mean, I, I'm not friends with her, but, you know, yeah, we've had meetings and she knows my name and stuff, but, uh, yeah. Okay, you know great. Her. Okay, so then you're familiar with her work, I, I assume, maybe somewhat? Yeah, it's seminal yeah. in British, um, in British. Yeah, um, yeah. In British They're, uh, and I, I guess Pippa Norris is, is a big deal in American. Uh, I believe she's American, and Joni's, they kind of did it yes. from us. Uh, um, Anyway, so this was a book which I didn't end up buying for my own use later on, but um, it's so good. But it's from like '93, uh, and it goes on uh, talks about the there's three levels of recruitment in local parties. First one is um, the like the system level, I guess you could term it, which is uh, like the political parties. Sorry, no, the, the the electoral system, political culture, and party system, and legislative competition. So it's kind of um, the macro uh variables on um women getting uh, how how political parties recruit um into the uh you know where they draw their candidates from so uh they talk about um how the different first past the post uh also known as single member plurality uh the uh ams additional member uh party list uh a ton of vote uh a av and um you know there's a lot of different um political systems in the world uh and how they affect the um the women uh they get elected and they also found similar to uh what uh 
Metlin has found in Norway that you know the more uh, proportional systems usually produce more women. Um, although there's some anomalies, like they point out that Italy and Canada, which are kind of uh, at the time were middle of the road in terms of they both had like 25 percent of their MPs were more uh, female, and Italy has a proportional system and Canada has a first past the post. So they kind of thought, you know, there's some odd uh, that, that stands out from the that general observation that you know. Yeah, if sorry, just to intervene again because I'm playing. I kind of feel like I'm playing the role of the seminar host <laughs> for everybody, for everyone else who's listening. But to restate kind of the obvious, you know, if women you know really wanted to be in office, why don't they just run for office? And one of the answers as to why we, as political scientists, and especially political scientists who use feminist critique, in other words, we're looking for sex differences and we're looking at gender roles and identity and the roles that those um, play in our politics, that one of the things we've observed is that the, the rates at which women participate vary by country. Yes. Now, that begs the question, what, what produces that variation, right? Because if it was an issue that women inherently, as essentialist theory saying, not running for office is essential to what women, women's character is, is when you're born female, you're just less likely to run for office because you're born female. That's essentialism, thing, basically. But if that was the case, then we should see an equal distribution of women's participation at a pretty low rate, regardless of what the country is. Right, or something nearer that. But we see you know, a couple points difference, or we see a rise at different times. So then the question becomes for us as social scientists, what is causing that change? What mechanisms are at work? And for people who study political institutions, one thing that you'd look at is, does the kind of voting system a country devises create differences in the number of women running and do some produce higher numbers of women and do some produce lower numbers of women. And when we see that observation, you know, what amount of that variation can be explained by the system, the voting system in place, or maybe there are different attitudes in the country that are, can explain the variation. Or maybe so we can test lots of theories to explain the same observation and then see which theories explain the most, produce more robust results. And so this is, again, the, the process that you're kind of going through here that you're discussing is um, trying to connect the different systems of voting to the number of women we see getting elected. Yeah, and I, I sort of, um, I guess my inspiration that it comes from, from, from uh, Dr. Norris and uh, Dr. Lewandowski is that I took... I actually think they're both professors, but it's okay. <laughs> Oh, are they, are they not doctors? I'm sorry. Okay. Well, they're doctors, but a higher level of doctor oh, is okay. professor. Right, okay. So once you become a, like in German, you're right. called professor doctor, but in American and in British English, they're just called professors. So, okay. I mean, it's not a demotion or anything because they do hold doctors. No, I don't want to. <laughs> very, uh, I, I owe them a lot. But, um, so, I drove from uh, the, the first level of recruitment, which is the... Uh, I guess the, the political culture and the uh, just the, the electoral system somewhat because I, I looked at all of the different um, the th at the time there was 308 ridings now there's 338 because we've had population growth in the intervening um, seven years since I uh, finished this but um, then I from, from the second level which is the uh, which I guess I'll, I'll introduce that now there's uh, the second level of recruitment is factors internal to, the, to any political any particular political party like ideology and organization so um i drew on that from the, from the ideology standpoint and um sorry can i stop you again <laughs> just to explain so within a country within a voting system then you have different another institutional factor that pr could produce variations is the political parties themselves so that the ways that the political parties decide how they put up their candidates might also influence the number of women who have the opportunity to run for office, which would then impact the number of uh, women who could possibly win. 
and, and become elected. So again, it's a very systematic process of looking at institutional things at this level. We're not looking at social attitudes, you know, of the general population. We're just looking at political institutions that humans have created and what variation in the outcomes we can observe. So, I mean, it's just, a, I know it's, to you, you understand it, but for people yeah. who haven't done political science, this <laughs> yeah, is... I'll, uh, I guess yeah, I'll try to... So I'm, I'm just, I'll, uh, <laughs> no, uh, we'll if you don't mind, answer. I mean, I've, I've taught these, no. I've taught these in classrooms, so I don't mind explaining them again, you know, but if I feel like something is an important concept that the average person wouldn't just get from understanding right. it. Yeah, that's I important. Take this, I, uh, that, that's that a, you're offering. a tendency of mine to, to, to do that. I have to... Uh, you know, uh, realize that people know what I'm talking about probably a lot of the times. Uh, yeah, well, so yeah, you know, I, I ran, you know, I taught classes and ran seminars where I knew it was going to be on the exam. Hmm? So, because I was writing it, so there would be points I'd say, "Look, this is an important concept. Let's unpack this a little bit more." Hint, hint. You know, this is something you should know about. You know, this core competency to pass this class. So I don't. I feel like that's the kind of role I'm playing is you know, like running the seminar and kind of highlighting the things that are definitely going to be on the test. <laughs> yeah. I never had a teach level science, but I, I, after I finished this, I went off and I'm like, oh, I kind of want to get out of academia for I don't know how long. So I decided to go do, uh, I, I became an English teacher, a second language teacher, and I went to different countries. And I, uh, so I taught that. And then I, when I was in the um, military cadets, I taught that somewhat a little bit too, because uh, we have this different, um, call them the Royal Cadets, and they have different, uh, the different branches. Well, it's like Royal Canadian, but everything in Canada is like royal, this royal, that. I'm, you're probably right. used to that because living in Britain, everything's royal, that royal, that, right? But yeah, that's true. Um, but yeah, getting back to um, the differences in party structures right. in terms of how they um, um, approach and recruit and right. uh, process women candidates. So they talk a lot about um, positive discrimination, which if people don't know what that is. It's, uh, it's methods that or, or an organization can put in place to um, empower a group, a uh, minority usually, to help them become kind of uh, more equal at the playing level. And it's like affirmative action would be an example of positive d discrimination in America. I'm sure people have heard of that before. It's kind of it's controversial at times. But um, in, in political parties, what they would do in terms of positive discrimination is that they like quotas. Okay. Um, and living in Norway, I got a a, a lesson in that because I was in, uh, involved in you know student politics, which is very robust in, in Norway. The students actually run the school in some respects, um, the university. They sit on the board, and their student parliament has a lot of power. And they also have uh, control of the cafeterias and stuff like that in some respects. So there are gender quotas for, um, like, there has to be two women, you know, two men, or however big the organization is, the board has to be equal gender balance. And uh, some parties did that, um, you know, there was there was a certain percentage, you know, it's like 50, 20, 40, it depends on the, um, I guess, your, your ideology. Now, some parties don't like quotas or any kind of positive discrimination because that's um, socialist, uh, you know, social engineering or something like that, cultural Marxism, whatever term right, those were. Yeah, I guess, yeah, so I guess I, I didn't mention it at the start, but my background in this topic is one, uh, I was in the Women in Politics Specialist Group of the Political Studies Association of Britain, um, mm -hmm. or the UK, sorry, not just Britain, it's the whole UK. And um, so I've sat through, since 2005 basically, um, until about 2000, 11 when I started my own study, um, every women in politics presentation of three to four papers at two conferences a year. And the majority of research on women in politics in the UK is done on women, women, women representat women's representation or women elections or candidates or your topic, basically. Um, elites. Um, and so I'm, I'm familiar with it. I, I taught also um, um, one lecture on different systems and how you can obtain 
representation, you know, like quotas that we're talking about, methods of positive discrimination. And then also I reviewed a book by Sarah Childs. I don't know if you know her work at all, but she's pretty big in the UK with, with studying women's women in parties. And so because I reviewed her book, I learned about what the Labour Party did with the all women shortlists and also the differences in the Conservative Party. So I might jump in a little bit with that, but mm -hmm. yeah, so um, the positive discrimination, the idea of a quota is usually 50-50 is pretty high. Normally the quota is um, like a 30% women. So, and the idea is that um, quotas, so just in defense of quotas, that without a quota, there is no incentive to try to recruit women. But once you pick a number and you um, put that out there, considered by some people to be like a critical mass of women, that you need enough women in a political party or you need enough women in a parliamentary body or an elected body to make a difference, to start changing the institution in a way that allows more women an easier time to access that path to power. So that's, in people, like you said, some people dislike quotas and it's social engineering and everything. Um, behind quotas are used. So just wanted to, again, throw that out there. Yeah, I, I think one of your, uh, you know, your nemesis is who uh, you debated different times in a uh, formal d debate. I'm sure we know what we're talking at this point, but um, I'm sure that that's what he would say probably, I imagine, about this kind of stuff. But um, so, and then they go into how um, like social and green parties, are, sorry, social, social democratic parties and green parties are more partial to direct intervention and recruitment. Um, and there's kind of a context. Um, a lot of I even seen right wing parties have quotas for, like the internal uh, administrative positions, like the party president, party board, um, stuff like that. They put them in place to get more women in there. And um, but I've never seen a right wing party actually use them um, in like candidate lists, like even in Norway. I believe the. The parties there don't the, the right wing parties don't use them in Norway, and um, that could have changed because I haven't gone for a while. But um, so it's not like the right wing parties are really averse to them; they're just averse to them outside of the party itself. In terms of they don't want to mess with the um, the local officials who usually choose the candidate, um, at least in Canada, and I think. Coming on in Britain, but do they have something called a writing association where the the local party uh, machinery chooses the candidate, or is that or the difference? Yeah, is, yeah. yeah, they have um, uh, interviews like at the candidate level okay. in the constituencies, and um, or depending on how much control there is from the central offices, so that headquarters. But yeah, the general thing is um, it's the local constituency, like Conservative Party, will be given five names and then they get to interview them and choose a candidate from the list yeah. there, there's a debate going on in Canada for a long time and um, I get into this a little bit uh, as well that um, the you know uh, does the party the, the national leadership of the party uh, do they have the right to to parachute a candidate and if they feel like it's needed for you know uh, start candidates you know be it women. Um, this is not just a gender, a, a gender um, element to this. There's also like the uh, re re representation of minorities as well, and uh, linguistic. Our our politics is like really defined by language a lot in our country, um, mainly because of Quebec and the interplay of uh, you know there was was the referendums and all of that separation. Um, that's largely died down but there's still there's still the party quebecois and people don't know, don't know what that is that's the, that's the separatist party similar to Sinn Féin um you know they actually there's then there's the federal wing called the Bloc Quebecois which actually sits in the federal parliament I know Sinn Féin doesn't really sit in the parliament usually at Westminster because they're they want to you know have Northern Ireland back with Ireland but they kind of they've showed up in recently because of what's what's happened with dupe and all of that and um, which is like their mortal en en enemy in a lot of ways. Uh, so parachuting is, is controversial. It's not done too much anymore. I remember um, one of the former leaders of Canada. Yeah, in the UK, they've been moving increasingly toward local candidates, trying to find a local candidate uh, to run, but people are still parachuted in. Yeah, 
it, 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 it's it's a practice in all, all over the world in a lot of democracies where they it kind of sometimes it's 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 it, it aliens people there was a the, um, the the last liberal prime minister before the current one paul martin he did it a lot and then he got a lot of flack for that uh from the, the, the party membership um and that may have contributed to his downfall somewhat we can argue with that uh, it's kind of a separate thing though but i won't get into that um so and then the theory yeah so <laughs> they go through a lot of different political parties and how they use um you know different quotas in different countries um but they come to the conclusion that you know left-wing parties are usually more su successful getting women in using positive discrimination um mainly, mainly because their um uh, membership is more amenable to it versus uh center or right-wing parties uh and then um because then they go into party context as well uh you know the type of organization a party uses um most parties in the world use a closed nomination system and not all not everywhere in, in america particularly there's the open primaries and um the candidates are ch chosen through an actual election where a lot of parties just um you know they interview people and they choose one um some in Canada, have elections like a very small. It's just, it's just the membership. Even when the party elects a new leader in Britain and Canada, it's just the membership of the party usually. Um, some parties, the like Conservative Party in particular in Britain, actually you can turf out a leader just by the, the 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 executive committee. Like that's that, that's how Margaret Thatcher got power. You know, a lot of people don't know that, but um, she was not elected by the, the party membership at. Uh, at large, it was they, she was just chosen from the higher echelon of the conservative party at the time, and then she went on to win her elections and everything. So that's kind of her story, the Iron Lady, and all of that. Um, then uh, they go into four types of classification of recruitment. I won't get into that because I didn't really use so much into that. Um, then there is the third level of recruitment, which is this is the more um, individual uh, factors like education, uh, you know, motivation of candidates, the attitudes of gatekeepers. This is kind of what you're saying before, about why do when people say women don't want to run kind of thing. You know, they're not encouraged. It, it's, it's, you know, something like uh, having the resources to run, uh, like money, you know, because women get paid less, right? I know that's controversial with a lot of people probably going to watch this because, you know, the wage gap's a myth, right? Um, Sorry, just to expand on this a little bit more. So the idea here is that another barrier to women's participation, or basically women running for office, is, as you point out, in Canada, it wasn't until the 1940s that they were even allowed to. So men had already built up these networks. And politics is, you know, yeah, there are sometimes newcomers, but politics is a lot of the same people because money gets passed down. Um, and so these connections are made, these relationships are forged. And so if you are in politics, you know, people in your family are more likely to run for office. Why? Because they can use your connections. Uh, but this was always restricted to men. So just because women got the opportunity didn't mean they, one, were accepted by the people who were already part of that networking process. But two, they had to build those networks, you know, or try to use family relationships to um, get into them. And that's why a lot of times you see women who do run for office are, you know, married to um, someone in office or the daughter of someone in office, because that is their way of making connections. Women from just outside in regular life who want to step up and run for office have to build all those things. And so this, again, is a barrier to getting more women candidates actually on the ballot. So just wanted to expand that out a bit. Yeah. And uh, just to explain on what you said there about the generational uh, sort of uh, women coming in from if their fathers were previous leaders and all of that. Um, actually, Professor Norris and Professor uh, Lewandowski, um, they talk about the female heads of state, like the originators, were all women that came in that kind of background. Um, like um, Indira Gandhi had a connection to, um, she's a daughter of um, Nehru, who was Gandhi's right-hand man and then leader of India for a long time. Um, recently in Korea, there was, uh, she's kicked out of office now. Her name was uh, Parking Hay, who was uh, 
president, she was, uh, uh, she was elected when I was living there. And um, her father had been president before her uh, several, um, you know, back in the 80s, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, and there's several other examples of women uh, who rose to power, who had um, fathers, who were leaders. I'm trying to think of some other ones. Um, well, Marie Le Pen. Yeah, Marie Le Pen. <laughs> Although, but uh, yes, that's a good example too. I'm thinking more of people women who are actually who are actually president oh, of the country. Right. But yeah. yeah, that's. But there's this like. Um, okay, uh, Benazir Bhutto was prime minister of India, but when her father was before her, um, and uh, there's a lot of other ones too. I just. I guess I'll stop there. Right, but, so that's uh, a, those are examples of that theory. You know, yeah, like there's, what the there's theory this, is accounting for. I guess it's ironic that a lot of the first female heads of state were from right-wing parties. That's like what I kind of was wanting to point out there, that even though left-wing parties seem to um, produce more candidates, um, right-wing parties because of the, you know, nepotism, if you want to call it that, of family uh, oligarchs, women got to be heads of state, uh yeah so um another, uh, another theory that is used to account for that is um because women are already associated with peace you know and like pacifism and um the, and the left as well is associated with those things uh, for a woman to get elected she has to overcome that female tendency and so being the iron lady being harder right wing especially on issues of the military and nationalism um it, it sort of it sort of degenders her. She's not seen as like a mother nurturing. Now, this is more in the West. You know, I think India has its very own politics when it comes to the role of women. But mm -hmm. um, at least, yeah. you know, like you think about the Iron Lady. You know, she, she was in some ways, she was the Iron Lady. You know, she was, she was not the typical nurturing soft type. And so that's another theory that's used to account for why we see women in positions of power, not elected to party level, like you know, congressional or parliamentary levels, but in executives, they tend to be come, they come more from the right. Yeah, they feel like like they kind of have to out outman, you know, the men, you know, like yeah, to be accepted. And I I guess Thatcher's kind of um, a prime example of that. I would go back even further to um, Queen Elizabeth the First, who was a, a I, I, British history is something I, I like to read about a lot. I feel like it's my own history because of Canada was, was they started by Britain in a lot of ways, and um, we kind of uh, I feel like Canada mirrors Britain more than any of the other countries that were started, you know, by that culture, uh, because the government is almost an exact mirror. Because the our House of Lords, which is just the Canadian Senate, is not elected as well, and they're appointed by the the monarch, the the Prime Minister. Um, Actually, that's a fun thing. Uh, monarch, all a monarch really is is uh, a person whose the, the decisions come down uh, to. It's not a king or a queen. It can just be a president or prime minister is actually a, a monarch themselves. So they're an elected monarch, but they are a monarch nonetheless. Um, so we uh, and we have the House of Commons too. I know Australia and New Zealand too, but like, um, and we um, have Governor General, who's the Queen's uh, representative effectively the head of state in Canada, who's, we just picked a new one actually, and it's a woman named Julie Payette. She's uh, used to be one of our astronauts, actually, the second female astronaut Canada ever had. And um, so she's going to be taken over now from a, a man who's retiring. And um, she's not our first female governor general. We've had two beforehand. Actually, two of the last four, three have been women. So they've been, women, Canadian women have been owning that position for the last, uh, 20 or so years now. Um, so that's good, I think. Um, so just to get back to uh, the theory. So um, they talk about uh, Norris and Lewandowski. They talk about a lot about the skills, the experience. And the question was in that um, you have to serve a long apprenticeship to be viewed as critical candidates in this parliament. A lot of people start at like, the lower levels, like the uh, cities and state legislatures and then working th 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 their ways up and they want you to have a activism background party service um party service is a big deal in canada um and also trade union work uh i guess if, if you're a socialist democratic party like the ndp in canada that's something that you want to have but that's changed somewhat now you don't need to be a party partisan to you know join up um 
the parties are looking for now for more just skilled people and not so much as hacks who have been around for a long time. I think I find that's better in terms of uh, getting more qualified people, men or women, doesn't really matter. Um, and, you know, the, 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 uh, they talk about the personalization of the, the process, how um, there's like training schools now for uh, female candidates to get them ready to, um, to run. I actually, uh, a couple of years ago in the 2015 election when uh, Justin Trudeau won, I ran, I, I worked for a woman who was running for the NDP in uh, the, the city I live in. Uh, she got second, which is, we, we thought it was a win because um, the NDP is very weak in this part of Canada. So we beat the conservative party, so we thought that was great. So I learned a lot about, um, you know, party nominations when I was working for her, and she's still a friend of mine to this day. Um, I kind of want to run for office at some point. I guess this is why I was so interested in this topic, is that I wanted to learn the inside of uh, how it works. And I kind of came onto the woman part of it when I found out there's very few women, uh, you know, it's a very low percentage, like less than half of um, the population of women in Canada, which is something like 52% of the population. And uh, that's why I wanted to do it, was to set, set some light on it. Um, so I, I think that's uh, enough for uh, the theories in the study. I can talk about the variables now, if you want me to, Christy, a little bit. Yeah, kind of sure. I was going to say, sure. yeah, you want to just explain a little bit. You're drawing yeah. on uh, data that people had already analyzed, and then you were sort of taking the newest data and adding it on to that, right? Right. So, um, so my data variable was just basically, um, you know, the gender of the candidate, um, of the party who had won um, the most in uh, any given riding. Um, I kind of focus really heavily on each individual writing, um, and I basically went through and I, uh, I guess that's methodology, I'll, I'll get into that later, but um, so the reason why looking at just the gender of the candidate from the party that won the most, um, sort of thinking that um, from the, the periods under study, which is 1984 to 2008, um, you know, party, party competitiveness, that's something you hear a lot of. It. Um, which is kind of the sacrificial lamb thing again, uh, where, you know, parties put women usually where they know that they're going to lose. It's more of a, just for show, you know, like, oh, look, we're nominating a lot of women, you know, but they're, they're not winning because they're not, they're putting them in writings where they can't win. So I, I wanted to see if the parties were, um, if they were putting women where, you know, they could, they could win in a safe writing. You know, if, if they weren't just pulling them off to the side, even though that's, you know, largely uh, been um, studied already, but I'm coming at it from a different angle. Um, so I, I looked at all the electoral records from, uh, all the general elections from 84 to uh, 2008, looking at all, um, all the writings going forward. Now, um, some writings didn't exist at the time when I first started this, so I kind of had to start from the point where they started. And go from there. Um, so I, I just control for that a little bit as well. Um, just making sure that, uh, that they're at least in a five of the um, eight elections that took place over that time frame. And uh, I use a lot of um, data from the Hansard. We, we have that in Canada as well. And also, uh, Elections Canada, which is the agency that handles all of the elections uh, in Canada, the organizations as well. Uh, and then that was the independent variable. Moving on to the independent variable. Um, so I had... Um, and just to say, the, the dependent variable is the thing you think is driving yeah. change. <laughs> it's okay. That's a, uh, sorry, the thing yeah, this, that changes, sorry. Uh, the dependent variable is, is is a thing that's a changing. It's it's the why. And the independent variables are the things that you think are causing the change. So if you change one independent variable, you should, um, or you should see enough, be able to explain an amount of variation. Or you look for an association in this case, because your stuff was um, cross-tabulation, right? Yeah, I used SP, uh, SPSS, the um, yeah, yeah. commonly used so social... What, yeah. 
Yeah, so you're basically looking at independent variables and then you're distributing them. It's a, and so yeah, a cross tabulation, like when you see uh, sex and party voted for, you know, you're looking at yeah. does sex, do you, when you line up party voting um, and then you look at the pattern by sex, do you see a difference that's big enough to be interesting? <laughs> so, yeah, is it significant or, or not significant? That's a, right. a terminology that we use a lot in the social sciences. Anybody's maybe read a, a peer reviewed journal at any point in their life? But a descriptive, but a, a cross tab shows you the pattern. It doesn't explain the pattern. Yeah, you know, causation so is not a correlation a, thing. Right. Yeah. So it's not an, in, you're not doing, you didn't do inferential statistics here. We're talking about what patterns do we see? So just again, when you're describing what you're seeing, so people don't think, oh, living in a city causes you to do this. Like, no, there's. Yeah, that's not, not, uh, you know, it doesn't completely confirm uh, the validity of, of this. It's just, this is the, the data that was collected. This is what it, it says, you know. Right. So it's the first, you know, it's an initial step. If you're going to try to do a causal explanation, the first thing you want to do is say, well, are there any differences? You know, so you actually you know, get the data out and you run these um, descriptive statistics across tabulation. You go, oh, here's a pattern. There's not a pattern. Here's, you know, here's differences. Here's not differences. Um, and that's what you first look for. And then from that, you know, you're in th you, you've got a theory that you're going to work with. And the next step would be to test that with inferential statistics, which we're not going to talk about today, but just to kind of, again, keep um, explaining to people what's going on here, the translation of, yeah, what you did with your data, and then the independent variables that you examined your dependent variables by in order to look for differences. Right, precisely. And uh, so what I did was I kind of, um, I had looked at things that, um, had been used previously in other studies um, and, and things that had been discredited largely like um, for example uh, Metlin and Stuttart had looked at um, the Catholicness if you want to put it like that of the how it affected women getting elected and they had found that, that, that that's not a factor at least not anymore back when they had done their um, uh, study of the provinces in Canada the provincial a woman getting uh, elected nominated kind of thing and they also had uh, looked at um, labor force precipitation like they're and then they had that 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 had not been a factor either so I kind of like left the issue of like religion and labor force participation alone and I looked at um, like education uh, average income uh, educational attainment which are things that are thought have an effect on um, getting women elected, but I, I, I look at it from the point of view from each riding. Like, does so in a riding with really high educational attainment, um, are there more women elected there? Um, and one of high income is there more women elected there, or in low income, you know, etc. Like that's basically what I wanted to do. So I kind of looked at those factors, but also like the parties. If the party uh, had won the most in a certain riding over 25 years, you know, does that help or not help? Um, does the the gender of the candidate nominated in 2008, or sorry, uh, no, sorry, uh, no, pardon me. Uh, if the if the party that won in 2008, uh, I, I put that up against the gender of the candidate um, who of you know, if a woman, if it had been a man or woman in in that election versus who won, did that make a difference? Like the party. So, sorry, I'm not explaining this very well. But um, I guess I'll just kind of maybe read what I have here. So the um, first variable was um, ideology. And what I did was um, I I, look, I simply look at the elections from '84 to '90, uh, sorry, to 2008, and see if um, if number one. How the number of women candidates increased over time. Uh, number two, has the number of elected MPs increased over time? And three, uh, did the Conservative Party or Liberal Party, um, you know, which one had more female candidates and uh, MPs over time? So it's essentially four things. And then I had two uh, two graphs showing it, you know, uh, the general trend and then the. Um, the two parties basically, which was in green 
and then red and blue for the two parties because uh, the, the liberals are red in Canada and the, the PCs are blue. So, um, or the conservatives are blue. So, see, in Canada, it's kind of it's it's switched. You know, you have red states and blue states in America, right. but it's so the opposite. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, um, anyway, so that's that. That's like basically the first half of the study was that first variable because I. It was its, its own thing on its own, essentially. Yeah, what, um, what were the what were the associations that you observed? Okay, yeah, just let me skip down to that because it's a different part of the, of oh. the area of the thing. Um, yeah, I had um, it's like forty pages to separate my variables and my because uh, I had a literature review between the the two of them. I wish I probably did not need honestly. I I had to fill out a certain amount of pages. I'm sure. You experience that They're like oh you have to write 100 pages so you've got to fill it up with with something besides you know because research doesn't always um fit into um 100 pages um eventually i, I did hack this down to like 20 uh 20 or so pages put in article form but i um i never got it published um i got distracted by other things like i guess but um so all right so the first thing so candidates, I'll separate this into candidates and, and, and into elected uh, MPs as well. So um, from 84 to 2008, um, so just let me get down to where it's written. Okay, so um, in the 84 election, there was uh, 214 women nominated for all the parties, uh, 27 more of the parliament. The old party had 14 nom 44 women nominated and Okay, I won't go through every, I'll, it's too long to go through all of that probably. I'll just go to the general conclusions. Yeah. From, from 84 to 93, it went, it went up every um, year. And 97 to 2000, uh, the number of candidates uh, decreased. And 2004, it increased mm. over 2000. But then in 2006, it, it went down again, a slightly decrease and then in, in uh 2008 it uh went up dramatically over the 2006 election so 93 was the highest year with uh i believe it was 456 women nominated and that's the highest that i studied it, it, it was the highest at the time because um I'd have to look at the two elections since then and see if it's gone up past 456, sure. uh, possibly. There's more writings now than there ever was, so that's quite possible. And then the Liberal Party seems to be very um, committed to women these days. Um, half the cabinet is is, uh, is a gender balanced cabinet, and the, Mr. Trudeau is very uh, committed to women's um, feminism. He even says, I am a feminist, which is kind of, I know that kind of pisses people off a lot, you know, on the internet. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I think I like you would, about him. That, yeah, <laughs> yeah. He's very popular with, with the ladies. I know, you know, cause not not in the same way that his father was, because his father, you know, was kind of a, a you know a ladies' man, if you want to go like that. <laughs> he's well. He's just so refreshing to see. Um, you know, well, I mean, Teresa May has apparently says that she's a feminist, but it isn't that often that you get uh, political leaders, you know, saying I am a yeah. feminist. Uh, so it's it is that way. It's uh, you know refreshing. He and Obama have that in common. All right. Uh, so for the two parties um, for candidates, um, so the lower party had an increase from eighty four to ninety seven without uh, without a break. However, and then from two thousand to two thousand six, they um, it dropped off slightly, but in two thousand eight, it recovered um, greatly over the since two thousand. So that was good. Uh, for the Conservative Party, um, it's all, it had been, beginning with 84 to 93, it had a continuing rise. And then in 93, it went down, uh, it declined um, in 97, and then in 2004 as well. In 2006 and 2008, the, um, Increased slightly and greatly in 2008. Uh, I think what happened with the Conservative Party is that in 2003, um, sorry, in, in 1993, um, they had they were the government and then they lost very badly, the worst defeat in all of Canadian history. 
where they had 193 seats and then they lost all the two of them. And the, the party itself was pretty much fractured, never the same. And there came a new party called the Reform Party, which is basically the western half of the, of the party from like basically uh, Manitoba on to BC. That, that, part, that, that wing of the party became its own thing. And then there was uh, from Ontario East as uh, the, the press and conservatives. And then that schism lasted until 2002 when they reformed. And then um, you can see that ever since they've reformed back to the, uh, of one party, they their number of candidates has increased uh, over what it was during the, the most in the 90s. So that's how I explain that. Um, I don't want to like make it look like, oh, the conservative party, you know, they just didn't not any women, but it's because they literally had two halves of the party separated out. So um, I'm sort of talking about the present conservatives from 84 to 2002. And from then it's, it's the unified conservative party that, that we have today, which Stephen Harper was the leader of. I've been a prime minister of Canada for uh, nine years. Um, so just there's kind of like that anomaly a little bit. Um, but then the total number of, of women elected uh, from both parties, um, the Liberals, it increased uh, in every election from 84 to 2000. And then it dropped down in 2004, 2006, and then it went up in the, actually no, it, it went down in 2000 as well. So, um, but they were out of power in those elections when it declined, so that may be the explanation for that. And then for the Conservative Party, um, the number of women elected decreased between uh, 93 to 2000, and then it went up uh, from 2004 to 2008. So, as we've been going for almost 19 minutes, <laughs> if you want to maybe, um, uh, so now we know what the results are, and I don't want to you know, push you too fast, but um, what were your um, sort of conclusions about this? Like, um, you know, can you kind of wrap up um, you know, with the theory and the other structures that you, you talked about, and then these actual results and this variation? Um, what were your concluding thoughts on on this on this analysis that you conducted? Okay, uh, yeah, I'll I guess I'll skip to the end. Okay, so um, what I found was, um, in general, um, you know, left wing parties uh, party ideology, ideology does affect the number of women that get uh, you know nominated and uh, elected overall. You know, uh, so that that notion I found exists in Canada even to this day. Um, with the variables, um, I can just go through and tell you which ones I thought were significant and not yeah. significant. So, um, starting with um, urban rule, which is a kind of uh, a thing that we talk about a lot in this kind of research context, um, I found that. Um, in Canada, it does make a difference um, in, in the number of candidates uh, that are female who get elected. It's uh, about um, a 10% difference. No, sorry, 15% difference. And um, so, sorry, sorry, it's yeah, 13 points, and that's significant at the 0 0.1 level. Uh, what I'm talking about, just to tell everybody, is uh, regression equations, where you take two numbers and put it into the computer program and it gives you a percentage, it regresses back from what you, uh, the, the, the data you entered in, and I'm not really an expert on those, but that's the best way they can put it in simple terms. Um, it, was, it was a cross tab or a correlation or a regression? Um, I believe it was, re at first my, press, my, uh, my supervisor said it was a regression, but then he says it's talking about cross tabs. So he kind of confused me from that, that point on. So um, I can um, tell you what I, I did, and maybe you can tell me what it was. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah, so me, is it, does it have a, does it have an, a, a gamma, a lambda, or something? Is it oh, it, uh, it's, it's, it's pi and Kramer's cram, five. That's the type of equation. It's a cross tab then. Yeah, if you were looking okay, at an so adjusted. Yeah, if you were looking at an adjusted R yeah. squared, then you'd be looking at a regression output. But if you're looking at uh, the that that metric, that's a cross tab measure. Yeah. So 
just briefly what I did for all eight uh, variables is I took um, the 108 writings, I pulled all the information for each variable out of the information because there's very good profiles on each writing and the Statistics of Canada's website. Um, and every demographic you can think of, uh, I put it into the machine. I said, you know, compare uh, uh, the 308, uh, the results from each variable against the main dependent variable, the gender of the candidate, and it gave me percentages of what I asked it. So the second one was um, what effect does the party that's won the, the seat the most in the 25 years has an, uh, an effect on? Or sorry, no, just the party party. Just the party. So I found that, um, I, so I studied the, the four federal parties, the main ones, the liberals, Bloc Quebecois, and EPA conservatives. And I found that there's a 10% point uh, difference between the NDP and everybody else, and it's not significant. Hmm. So. Okay. Yeah, and so what you would one thing you could do next then, if you were going to carry this forward, um, for instance, is you, you would take more independent variables, um, and you would put them into a model, and then you would look to see if there was, um, you know, which var variables did the best best at explaining right. the variation. Yeah. So um, sometimes something looks like it doesn't have an effect because it's being picked up by a different pattern. But if you control for a few other things, then yeah. you see. So this is why we're talking first about what you just see in the data, and then you step it up to yeah. an inferential um, um, method where you can individually like, uh, assign uh, explanation. Yeah. The party had an approximate significance of, of 0.271, um, which, and my understanding is pretty, you want to be cl as close to zero as possible. That's how it was this button to be back, back up. Like the closer the number is to zero, the more significant it is. And right, so it's a, you're talking about the chi squared? Yeah, like the, um, the how they get this, this the, uh, when, when they talk about significance of a variable in, in the literature. Right. That they're referring to so that, yeah. how close it is to zero in terms of the sorry math's not my strong suit. Um, yeah, that's probably it, my social sciences. Like, but, yeah. yeah, so I, I taught statistics. It's okay. So okay. what a what a what a chi square tells you in a cross tab or a statistical significance measure. It tells you uh, the likelihood of you getting the result that you're observing. Um, based, um, it, it would be not representative of what the actual population is. And so when something is p equals less than 0 0.001, what it's saying is that, look, in ed, you could, if you draw from a population infinitely, eventually you're going to pick one that isn't representative because just by chance, right? So if, like, think if you had a bag of Skittles and you reached in and you would get, if you drew out 10 Skittles from the bag, um, or let's say 50, or it's a big bag of candy, all right? There's like a thousand pieces of candy and you reach in and you grab a hundred and you look at the distribution. You know, you're going to have some variation, but you're going to have, let's say, you know, um, all of the colors represented in some percentage. But what are the chances of actually pulling out only the red ones? A handful of only red Skittles. Well, if you keep grabbing into that bag for infinity, eventually it's going to happen, right? So the possibility of you getting something that's just completely unrepresentative is always a possibility. And when a measure is statistically significant to 0 0.001, what that's saying is the chance of you looking at this distribution right here, whether there's no relationship or um, a very different, you know, there's a big difference between them, is it would be a one in a thousand draws out of the sample for you to get something that wasn't accurate. And so we're saying that we're highly confident that we can generalize from what I'm observing to the wider population. Now, it might be that there's no relationship and it's statistically significant. <laughs> what you're saying is it's an accuracy, like how much confidence do we have in what we're observing? Um, and so that's what you're looking at. Yeah. I was surprised that the, the, the party didn't come out stronger than that, but um, like, Historically, the NDP in Canada has, and it did show that, that they had, um, they were, they were, um, they, they weren't the highest percentagely, but they, they were only, uh, actually the Bloc Quebec Bloc, but they're, uh, they're a social democratic party, at least because Quebec is, that's where they're from, so it kind of forms like, their policies on everything, so it was pretty close. They said that the Conservative Party had like 18% and everybody else had like close to 30, so 
it does sort of point there's a difference between the right wing party which we only have one understanding and then three other ones which are left wing or centrist um yeah well so if it, you were to do this with with a, an inferential method you could look at something like well not really time series analysis but you could have like a lagged effect for incumbency mm -hmm. for instance and so you might look at open seats versus or you know um where people have more of an opportunity versus where there's some people who've been elected yeah previously or and that was so kind of detail i wanted to go into but like i don't know i just my supervisor and i thought it, it, that was just too much for the yeah 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 um that would be way too much for what you yeah. had to cover okay. yeah <laughs> i'll just speed up here i'll just go faster okay so, so for education um i broke it down into four things uh less than high school high school post-secondary and then uh, people with grad degrees. Um, so I found that um, in, in the two post-secondary categories, uh, it was uh, quite more likely that, you know, you would get um, a woman elected in a, in a, in a riding with, with more education. Yep. And the, the difference was 11 percentage points from the, the lowest to the, the highest. So, um, okay, just to go through that. And that was weekly significant at the 0, 0 0.7 level. Um, so probably the party that won in 2008 variable versus the, the general candidate. Um, so of the parties that won in 2008, um, the NDP had the highest percentage of female candidates elected and and that was that was significant uh, at the zero point six level, weekly significant. Um, then the gender of, of the winning candidate in the two thousand eight election. So this this is the candidate, the, the gender of the candidate won without the party label on it. Um, so I found that uh, that uh, in two thousand eight a higher higher percentage of female candidates um, one versus male in in writings um, so it's, it's clear that female candidates uh, when, when female can uh, are candidates are placed in writings that are actually won by the party um, the difference is 80 percentage points so the showing that women can win in uh, election or where parties have historically uh, one in the 25 years that we're here. Yeah, I don't um, know. If, I'm just worried if people listening are, you know, just going through the variable by variable, they're kind of probably going to forget. So, do you have a more of a, a generalist summary that you could just give a big picture on rather than going through them variable by variable? Sure. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so in general, uh, what I found was, uh, Sorry, I have to skip down uh, to where my results are, the, the closing arguments. Yeah, great. So overall, the amount of candidates uh, or female candidates, uh, you know, has increased in general. It, it did dip uh, in the 90s, but it came back to um, uh, to uh, pretty close to the original level uh, in, in 93, where it hit the high, the sort of high. Um, there, there's a lot of turmoil in the 90s. I, I attribute to that with the Conservative Party and um, just in general in Canada, with the, the referendum and all of that stuff in 95. Uh, the, the number of, of women elected um, has also increased since 1984. However, there were drops at certain points uh, as stated before. And um, when it comes to the uh, Different variables. <laughs> so, I guess he added this part out, right? This is the advantage of doing it like this. Um, okay. So, um, sorry, I have, I should mark this down better. Okay. All right. I'll just. Uh, okay. So, starting with uh, urban and rural settings, um, what I found was uh, urban settings in general help women get elected. But when you go into the bigger writings with the heavy, heaviest populations, it doesn't make a, a profound greater uh, effect. 
So small cities, big big cities, same thing pretty much. Um, when it comes to um, the uh, okay, so the it comes to the party that that won the the districts uh, historically. Um, the Liberal Party did not not the most candidates, but it was not uh, it was not, not the NDP that had the most female candidates. That was the Black Um In areas of high ed educational attainment, uh, the the higher the education, the better. So with university degrees, advanced degrees, when those areas uh, ranks up higher incidence of that, that helps a lot with, with women getting nominated and elected. Um, so you're saying if you're in a college town, you're more likely to have a female representative than if you live in a place where the nearest university is mm -hmm. pretty far yes. away and no one in the yes. yeah people have you know, yeah. yeah yeah so that's basically what I mean by that yeah sorry I, I should probably uh, elaborate on that a little bit um, okay next um, so in the 2008 election uh, it's clear that the Conservative Party had the highest number of female uh, MPs. And the NDP had the highest number of uh, candidates. Or sorry, the, uh, the NDP had the highest percentage of female uh, MPs. Uh, not candidates, because that was before. <laughs> okay, uh, when it comes to the gender candidate uh, selected by the party who has historically won the district, um, The vast majority of the cases where the party, uh, it was where the, the woman's female, it seems that uh, it did help the woman get elected, if it was a safe seat or not. So what I mean is, um, why historically one is uh, is what what's what they call safe seats, which are where the party has a history of, of winning that seat comfortably over the, the period uh, for the years. So um, what I'm saying here is, that women, uh, if they're placed in safe seats, can win. That's what I mean by that. Um, There's no difference between the probability that a woman candidate will be elected in the district with a uh, higher or low frequency of, of winning. Um, so if the party looks at a polling and they think that um, basically uh, uh, the probability of a candidate being a female, there's a little known difference when it comes to, so th that's the sacrificial lamb thing again, mm -hmm. where a party looks at, say, oh, we, we want to nominate women, so we'll, we'll put them in this district where we, we don't win hardly ever. So. Um, I didn't find any kind of uh, difference between that. So you can say that again, that you can put a woman in a, in a, in a, a competitive seat and win. Um, okay, so uh, average income, and that's the last one, I promise. Uh, so what I found was that uh, the greater income of a district did not uh, have a net effect on the like, you know, get elected. So if you're in a rich district or a poor district, it didn't really make an, uh, a difference. Okay. And that's about it. Because I've already gone and talked about Matlin, and I kind of compared my what I found to theirs, and that's, that, that's basically the, the end of it, and then the bibliography. So. Uh, do you have any questions, I guess? <laughs> no, I think we've gone over it pretty much in depth. So, yeah, thanks for sharing that um, and coming on air and explaining. And it was a good opportunity to dive into some feminist theory concepts. You know, people have told me often that, you know, feminism can't be scientific. Like, well, you can take the theories and test them with the scientific method. So I don't really know what they mean when they say feminism isn't scientific. Um, and, you know, you've also taken theories developed to account for sex differences, which is what feminists, one aspect of feminist critique, and you were able to look at data and draw conclusions. So it's, it's nice to see, you know, those things, an example of this, you know, that you can talk to and explain your relationship with, how you came to do it, and then in the end what you found. Yeah, uh, I enjoyed the opportunity because you know, I watched your debate recently with, well, it was from last year, but you reposted it. I don't know, I didn't see it. I don't think I watched your channel at the time when that first happened, but um, oh, okay. your debate with Sargon, your formal debate, that, then yeah. just that was nice to see because we don't, 
a lot of debates on the internet are not like what I call actual debates because they're not they're just like discussions where people throw opinions back and forth when you actually had questions um, presented by um, your friend that has unfortunately passed away uh, since then. Uh, my condolences mm -hmm. about that, by the way. Um, so uh, I just want to, you know, say that everybody is listening. You know, the social sciences have, you know, empirical methods that are used. It's not. I'm not just talking about feminism. I'm talking about everything. You know, history, political science. You know, economy. Er, you know, everything. So it's becoming more all the time. It's increasingly. If you look at the history of social sciences more like you know the methods are more valid and it is you know people should recognize that and I know over my life I've gotten a lot of flack for doing this you know oh you can't get a good job with it blah 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 right so kind of thing so just to tell people everything about studying it you know it's you can find uh, a fruitful career and you know rewarding life experience by doing it can you understand your own society or other societies better? Like why, you know, why when we look around do we see the number of women? Why is it different by country? You know, this is, these are the questions that we investigate and then we can give answers. And if you think that there should be more women in political spaces, which I do, because I think we, could talk, we haven't talked about like Pitkin and the, and the concept of representation and the idea of substantive and descriptive representation. But um, then you can say, okay, these are the things that seem to work or these are the conditions that seem optimal for women to try to run for office because you can't win if you don't run. So the first step is how do we get more women to run? You know, what, what would it take? Yeah. And uh, uh, answering these questions will have an impact on our society. There, there's this concept that was put forward in, um, I have to check the, it's one of the authors I used, uh, I don't want to uh, get the credit from the person, but it's called um, Fetish for First. And something what that is, is that, they stated that uh, society uh, tends to pay attention to the first uh, women who gets uh, in a certain position, and then after that, um, it's sort of uh, enough, mm -hmm. and then they don't need to pay attention anymore. Like, oh, there's, there's always been a woman prime minister. You know, it's the glass ceiling is a broken kind of thing. So, mm -hmm. but that's not the end of the story. Like, you know, there's still work to be done, and trying to make our society understand that, that, you know, 25% is, is, is that enough? Like, that's the question uh, I would just pose to everybody, you know, is 20% female MPs in a country, is that enough? I mean, that's Canada, but, you know, I know in other countries there's more or less, but that that's kind of the, the question that you have to put to any uh, polity, you know, culture in, in any given country and, and say to the population, you know, is that enough? Yeah, actually, I've got a plan for an upcoming episode of This Week in Stupid Misogynist, but kind of a twist, where I look at, um, in this case, women, specifically women politicians, and the bills that they're introducing, and the issues that they are addressing, and um, the, you know, the link between having women in those positions to introduce legislation, having a lived experience like the people that they're writing the legislation for. Um, yeah, but so that's a, an idea for an upcoming episode. But yeah, Tim, thank you so much. It's you know it's been it's been like doing a seminar again. <laughs> it brings me back to my days of you know uh, women in politics courses and and teaching on stats and and how to apply theory and things. So it's been it's been really lovely to chat. Don't go anywhere because um, I'm just going to wrap up the episode for the broadcast. Sure. But is there anything that yeah before we close it out? Um, do, is there any other closing thoughts um, that you wanted to? Yeah? Just. Um... I guess if people want to read this, then um, I can give Christy the the actual edited version of it, the article form that I made a long time ago. I gave her the full thing. If you want either or, I can give it to her. She can distribute it to anybody who wants it. I know that she has, uh, you know, uh, four five thousand. A rough copy. I have a rough copy, right? Yeah. I, know. Uh, I, I assume her audience of four five thousand people is is feminist mostly. I know there's probably some people that just watch it to troll. Uh, she's having a lot on. That, that masochist tendency that we have on YouTube, it seems like, you know, I try to avoid yeah. that, watch people that I uh, I know it's just make me angry. Um, but I can provide that, that to her and she can distribute it if, if anybody wants to get it from her. 
if they are, they can. Yeah, they can can find a, if you've got it up like on a Dropbox um, or something, or a link to um, an online platform or something. Uh, I, I'd have to put it. Uh, yeah, I'll set it up. I don't have it like that. Um, it was published to the to the library of the university in Bergen, but that's the only place it was ever put, as far as I know. Um, they, uh, like I said, I, I had read it for article submission, but I, I didn't get around to putting it out to anybody. And it's probably too late now because it's, it's too old. I, I'd have to probably update it with the two elections since then. Um, so yeah, but, but yeah. that's just ways to, yeah to get an online link to it. Okay, all right. Yeah. So yeah. Um, have I have a Twitter. I set up actually for this because I didn't have one before. I want to talk to Christy. I just want to talk, or want to talk to me, whatever you know. Put it, but it's like it's uh, at I talky teacher. Uh, it it's like I talk I teacher. That's that's my handle. I'm the only person that ever wanted that one, apparently. So, uh, <laughs> and that's like the real I talk to teacher, like the, you know, like, the, like Trump does. But you know. <laughs> so good. you can find me on there. I, I check it from time to time. I don't go on it a lot. Um, I just have Facebook and LinkedIn, and that's where I'm not a big social media person. I don't have a YouTube channel. Um, I just have a video advertising my teaching services on the website I talk you. That's about it. So, anyway, um, it was great to talk to you, uh, Dr. Winters. Yeah. Um, and I guess we can close the show. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. All right. Well, then, uh, to everybody who is watching, I want to thank you for your time and attention, staying with us all the way to the end. Uh, and all that's left to be said is that I've been Christy. You have been awesome. Well done on you again for your social science nerdiness. And I will talk to you again very soon. <laughs>